So today we're going to be looking at what our key considerations are for building global facing businesses from the Isle of Man and some potential opportunities to develop our offering uh, and also how our ecosystem can support this. We will be taking questions on Slido and from the audience, uh, so please do use either the QR code or slido.com with the hashtag DI2022. So I'm joined today by an absolute powerhouse of a panel today. Uh, I'd like to welcome on stage Kim Broad, Chief Compliance Officer of Games Global, Guy Templer, Non-Exec Director, Startup Investor and Past Chief Operating Officer of PokerStars, and Heath Cram, Chief Operating Officer of Borg Poker. So, I think let's start today with each of our pan panellists telling a little bit of a story about how the business that they're speaking about ended up uh, here on the Isle of Man. So, let's go for Kim first. Thanks, Abby. Thanks for having me. So, Games Global um, is a very new company to the Isle of Man. We began operating in May of this year. Um, we are a B2B software supplier and we focus on game development right through to the licensing of those games. Um, the reason we are housed on the Isle of Man is because we made a number of acquisitions and we were lucky within that acquisition that we had the opportunity to set up home on the Isle of Man and also access to the high calibre staff that came with some of those businesses that we acquired. Thank you. And Guy? Hi, yeah, so um, uh, I think uh, Abby really asked me to uh, here today to talk a, a little bit about the history of STARS because uh, Poker Stars is a, is a very interesting case study for the Isle of Man because it is a company that really saw its full life cycle um, as uh, uh, an entrepreneurial small family owned business turning into a public company, turning into ultimately the biggest online gaming company in the world, all from the Isle of Man. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting story. There are lots and lots of lessons to, to learn from it, both good and bad. I, I, won't, I won't bore you for hours with the, uh, uh, the, the history of STARS, I think, um, but to, to suffice to say, um, one of the reasons I think the founders chose to come to the island, we, we originally came to the island in 2007. We were seven employees at the time. Um, when I left the business uh, in 2019, at, at its peak on the island, 550 employees and another 3,000 employees around the world. Uh, and that entire cycle happened uh, on the Isle of Man. The founders chose the island. Obviously, they were looking for a good offshore, low-tax jurisdiction for a gaming business. Um, but they had choices. They had a significant number of choices. They specifically looked at Malta, Gibraltar, I believe they looked at Alderney and the Isle of Man. One of the reasons they went for the Isle of Man, of course, uh, at the time, the primary reason was the regulatory regime, which I'm sure we'll um, uh, come on to talk a little bit more about, um, both in terms of its, its relative robustness, but also in terms of its user-friendliness to operators. And that continued to be the case throughout the, 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 next, uh, the next 12, 13 years of the business. Um, the second reason that they came to the Isle of Man, actually lot, lots of people don't believe me when I say this, um, uh, Heath will, uh, knows this story as well, was the weather. <laughs> um, amazingly, um, actually the weather and the very rural environment that's here. Um, the Isle of Man appeals to certain people in different ways. Uh, and actually compared to Malta where in the summer it is, it is exhaustingly hot, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, this is a much more temperate climate, which the founders happen to love. Uh, compared to Gibraltar, this is a very rural um, uh, environment, which as it happened, the, uh, the founders uh, uh, happened to love. So primarily re regulatory reasons, but the stars ended up on the island. They grew the business aggressively, and I think in 2009-2010, we, we professionalised the management. Um, uh, at, that was the time at which I joined uh, with a number of colleagues. Uh, and then we went, and from the Isle of Man as its operational headquarters, uh, grew our product lines, um, grew our markets very, very substantially, ending up in, in the space of about seven or eight years with 21 different jurisdictional licenses, uh, all operationally managed from the Isle of Man, uh, operating in over 100 countries. Um, and of course, like all businesses on their life cycle, we got to a point where actually it was time to go on the acquisition trail come 2017. Uh, the company then went and bought Skybet in the UK, Crownbet in Australia and William Hill. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a real trajectory for a global business. Ultimately, consolidation 
um, um, uh, went the other way for stars and, and we sold the business to, to Flutter in 2020. Um, so um, it was a real uh, life cycle that this, this truly global business saw on the island. Um, and we saw both the positive and the negative. Strong positives in terms of the regulatory environment that, uh, that exists on the Isle of Man for the e-gaming business, uh, for the e-gaming industry. Um, and I'm sure we're going to come on to talk about some of the, uh, the lessons that we learned along the way in terms of future growth. Uh, sorry, I promise. Uh, oh, it's, a, it's a clean handover though. Uh, I go back a long way with Poker Stars and having been on the island for 13 years, I can categorically say I would never live in Gibraltar or Malta. <laughs> so the weather is a funny point. Um, I was more recently an executive director for Flutter, the new parent company of uh, Poker Stars, before a long, long time operational director for the same firm. And you'll see on the screen that I've moved to a startup. And the reason this startup is in the Isle of Man, holding today an MGA Malta license, hopefully corrected with the GSC soon here. Um, is talent. So it was very interesting to hear the previous session about jobs outweighing the number of talent and all of the talent issues ahead of us. We exist here because of that talent. Guy mentioned Poker Stars peaking at about 550 people. When I left, it was at 320. We need to ensure that number doesn't go lower with people leaving the island because some great talent on the island. So we currently have 13 people with aspirations of being in the hundreds. 12 of those 13 are poker stars people. We need to correct that. We need to branch out wider too. So I think today it'll be inter interesting to discuss while jobs might outweigh talent today, that may not be the future. We're staring down the barrel of basically a global recession and we're very lucky in iGaming that we're almost immune to uh, problems in the econ economy and politically. Uh, if you think about the certainties in life, gambling is in a bucket with I would say cigarettes and alcohol is largely immune to anything that happens and we saw probably the biggest peak in online gaming during the pandemic. Now <laughs> people were locked in their homes and looking for something to do but that's just one example of where our gaming is well positioned for growth. So as insurance companies or banking firms or financial industry start to feel pressure from the economy we sit here as a place with lots of open jobs saying come over here. So really interesting discussion I think to be had about you talk about cross-pollination, but also cross-skilling and turning ourselves into a tech hub. But going back to, not just say, oh, we've been e-gaming for 20 years, so what's happening in esports and blockchain? Say esports is a really interesting opportunity, and as the economy goes the wrong way, we can build it back up and hopefully uh, leverage the fact that we've probably got the best regulator in the world in the other man. God, you're nice. Um, no, that's some really, really interesting talking points on that. So I think it'd be interesting for us to dig in a little bit deeper into what does a global facing business need from a home jurisdiction to drive that business growth? Um, Kim, do you want to pick that up first? Yeah, I mean, I think he's given us a good indication of that to start with. We have a very, very approachable regulator. That was also one of the contributing factors for Games Global when we were acquiring our initial licenses. Um, we knew that the time frame to license in the Isle of Man was going to be a lot quicker than around the globe and that's because of the interaction you can have, you can um, deal with any issues quite quickly. That is not the case in other jurisdictions, especially across the water in the UK, you can't often even talk to a person, um, so I think that, that's a good one. Um, there's a lot going on in the island that um, again, he's just touched upon from the, the, the talent point of view. Um, we, we were fortunate that we had a talent base we could tap into, similar to Four Poker actually, if everybody's out of uh, X Poker stars. But again, one of the things that we really need to focus on is growing that talent and bringing it into the island. As a business, I know that we are going to hit a point where we have roles that we want to fill here on the Isle of Man that we won't be able to do. Um, we, I think there's a panel on at the moment actually based around HR and resourcing and we are creating talent pools within our business, development plans and such like and on the Isle of Man we have a number of organisations um, in the sports services that can develop homegrown talent and programmes in university and things like that but actually we are going to hit that saturation point where there is a lot more jobs than what we need um, and that probably ties into the work permit um, issue that was touched upon again on the last panel. Um, I think Guy, you've got some 
thoughts on that one? Well, yeah, specifically on the work permit, I mean, I, I, I'm going to be brutal and frank about it. There is absolutely no rationale whatsoever for the work permit um, today. It's purely, uh, again, looking externally, it's, it appears to be a political issue, and, and, and I can understand why. But we only have to look around. Most of our industries have got job openings. I believe there's about a thousand jobs that are unfilled currently on the island. We're a small island with a thousand jobs unfilled. Uh, and these aren't high level jobs either. This is across, uh, across the economy. So you have to ask, what is the purpose of the work permit? Um, we know, and, and the government wants, and the strategy talks about uh, obviously growing the population and so on. We know we need to get young people onto the island. If you're a graduate in the UK and you're interested in offshore jurisdictions, under the work permit scheme, you've got not a chance, very little chance whatsoever of getting onto the island um, because of the way the scheme operates. But yet at the same time, we're trying to change the demographic of the island um, to get more young people onto the island. So this work permit scheme makes, I'm afraid, absolutely no sense whatsoever. And I would certainly be a very strong supporter um, uh, of a move to try and get rid of the work permit scheme. The other, the other thing that I think is worth briefly touching on, again, going back to my experience of growing a go global business, particularly a global business which by its nature needs to be offshore from its primary markets, um, one of the things of course you need to do is you need to bring people from the markets you're delivering services and products in, you need to bring them to your headquarters to make sure you don't create uh, any, any significant um, um, tax presence in, in those jurisdictions. And of course that means bringing people from all over the world to the island. That means actually you need an international talent pool to grow an international business. Um, now, we have just gone through an incredible series of shocks um, uh, with, with the, the pandemic and we haven't yet felt the worst of actually what's just happened in terms of the talent pool. Brexit has taken a massive, massive uh, fire hydrant and started emptying the talent pool by removing the ability to easily move, at least subject to work permits, easily move people from Europe, from the 27 jurisdictions that actually lots of our companies deliver products and services into, onto the island. Uh, and now not only do we suffer work permits, but we suffer the, the visa process as well. Uh, and again, this is something I don't think we should look on this as a negative. I actually think the Isle of Man should own the process. The Isle of Man should actually get out and say, well, how do we turn this into an opportunity? How do we create a system in which, actually, it's really easy for an international business to bring people from Europe onto the island, uh, and easier than it is to bring them into the UK? Now, that would be an amazing thing. So that's just on, on, on talent. <laughs> But I mean, again, on, on other things that, that, that global businesses need, uh, I'm going to um, go back for a second to, to the regulatory regime. Um, and I do think it's worth looking at the history. The e-gaming the e regulator has been fantastic and, it, and it's trod the line very well between being a, a regulator that's respected in the rest of the world and continuing to be, uh, for many years, um, uh, very user-friendly. Um, but of course, for any of our businesses, um, whether it's a uh, fintech business, whether it's an e-gaming business, your primary regulator isn't the only, uh, uh, the only part of government that you need to support the growth of the business. There's lots of other pieces as well. Um, and I think it's really incumbent as, as we move forward as an island for there to be a real strong focus on one or two sectors that government and all of the regulators can work together on and can understand in huge amounts of detail because it's in the detail that you create the competitive advantage for the island that will make people want to come here and i'll give you i'll give you i'll, I'll give you a, a, well i'll start with a negative example um, so in the case of the it stars history as, as many as some of you will know stars actually had to re-domicile its consumer facing business in about 2018 in 2018 um, because of, uh, fundamentally because of um, some VAT issues. Um, in, uh, we re domiciled to Malta, primarily because um, in Malta, the legislature had moved to create um, a, uh, a legislative environment that was supportive of VAT exempt businesses. So for those of you that aren't in the e-gaming industry, e-gaming in most jurisdictions is VAT exempt. Fundamentally, that means if you can't recover your VAT, you're facing the potential of another 
probably 15 to 20 percent tax on revenue. That becomes impossible to manage. So the Isle of Man has been brilliant um, um, uh, in the way it dealt with uh, VAT issues for, for VAT exempt businesses, um, but it never managed to quite bake it into um, how it operates from a legislative perspective where, where, where Malta did. This is a very boring discussion and most of you in the room from professional services will know far more about this than I do. But suffice it to say, it's those kinds of detailed discussions that, that the government um, and regulators need to look at across the board in each of their industries to understand, well, what do we do to make, to create small competitive advantages? And it's often this tiny bit of minutiae because if, as a business manager, and as a commercial manager of a large business, you're looking constantly at these tiny things which make tens of millions of pounds difference to your business, and they cause you to change direction. And of course, when you get big businesses, once you've taken that decision, it becomes very difficult to, 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 to reverse it. Okay, is there anything outside of the initial uh, discussion around skills, and um, obviously around the back position on, on that, is there anything else that we feel that businesses find challenging? Well, launching a startup today and almost rewinding the clock and going through the poker stars journey with another poker company, um, I, I could say a lot of the things that got poker stars here in the first place still get people here, still got us here. I mentioned the talent, but also the technology is very sound from what you get from Max Telecom through to Continent 8, data warehouses. We, we, it's very important, I think, in a post-pandemic world, especially if we're going to this week or all day talk about modern industry and a forward-thinking plan and tapping into new technologies to also think about the modern company. The modern company, and at least in our industry, are not sitting in the office five days a week. It's hybrid working, it's remote working, so I won't touch on um, work permits because guys cover that off very nicely. But uh, we also have to be forward-thinking in the fact that people are not going to be sitting in a 200-person office, or at least 200 of them shouldn't be sitting in a 200-person office. That's one easy way to not be competitive with a modern employer and, and in, in terms of attracting skills. Work from anywhere, remote work is, is critical. I think for us it was about making sure that when you sit on Zoom all day and when you are working remote with the number of offices around the world that things don't break and things go smoothly. And it is, you have to join a, a, a phone call and there's colleagues from India and he drops out and you're still on. That's a good thing. Uh, so I, I think there's a lot of positive to still being based here, but we need to think a bit broader and tap into some of the real challenges about being a mobile community again and what are our travel links like and can we get off this island? Can we get people from headquarters when headquarters is not from here onto the island? So I think the whole notion of the home base or the home a uh, nation that, that becomes Isle of Man, it, it takes a different dimension when you say, well, business is largely remote anyway. So how do we operate as an island with thankfully good technology as, a, as the home base, but realize that the, the nature of business has changed and things like removing work permits and a number of other things that Guy said as far as blockers will help that. But yeah, I'd, I'd just probably add a, add a positive to the story that there's still a lot of reason to start here but realise that people won't be here all the time and do all of our regulations, laws and, and uh, government support that sort of freedom of movement, if you will. Great, thank you. So I, I guess we recognise that some of the, these things are not going to be easy, nor are they going to be quick to fix. Uh, and in most cases, it requir requires a much more joined up view um, through different areas of government. Um, but how can we, as the digital agency, Digital Isle of Man, work with our stakeholders, work with our businesses, to try and understand some of these issues and look at the realms of possibility? I mean, I think our digital is doing a lot of that already. Even the draft um, programme for 2023, if you flick through that, there's probably nothing that we haven't covered today on all of the panels, and we will do this afternoon, that actually you've already got that on your radar. What we really need is actually that other layer of government to be able to act fast for some of these initiatives. Obviously, change to regulation and legislation takes time, but we need the powers that be in the government, not just the digital agency and everybody within this room to, to sort of push to be able to affect change that can really support businesses going forward. 
yeah, I, I think it's clear it is on everyone's radar as well. The, these are things that are being talked out throughout the day. You know, we've got a whole session on the um, skills strategy with our um, ex um, executive agency chairs later on. We've got panels. So in, in a sense, it is really helpful to hear your view because it's strengthening what we're already doing as well. Yeah, I mean, just to, to add to that, I think um, I want to go back to this, this, this point around focus. Um, because it's I completely agree with Kim. We have to we have to look at look, what's this what's this island got that's that's unique. You know, when you compared with with all of the jurisdictions uh, around it and the other jurisdictions, you know, we have theoretically the potential to act quickly and promptly um, on legislative change, on regulatory change, on setting up new regimes, and we really need to to find the next wave of industries. Uh, and support those, not just through um, uh, the agency model, which, by the way, I think is a good one, but also creating at a very early stage the right legislative, the right regulatory frameworks. Um, again, I think Lyle and the, the blockchain team, as it was started in 2018, is fantastic, but Malta started two years earlier. They started legislation two or three years earlier. And, of course, today, Malta are in the world of, of blockchain and crypto. I believe they currently directly employed are about 700 people in that industry. Indirectly, it provides huge support for all of the, the professional services industries around it. And they're now managing assets of, uh, uh, of I believe, in the region of about uh, 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 an astronomical sum of money. Um, so, so we didn't move early enough when it came to legislation. But we can, and we know we can. You only have to look, for example, to the marijuana legislation. Whether you think marijuana is the right or the wrong sector to be getting into, actually look at the lessons from that. That was done incredibly quickly because there was a willingness in government, there was a willingness across departments to work on a really complicated issue. And it just shows what the potential is on the island. But what we need to do is to make sure we're focused. It's, it's very easy for, for, um, uh, uh, for government to try and please everybody all of the time and, and try and do many, many different things. Actually, what we've got to do is we've got to be brave, we've got to take risks, and we've got to f narrow our focus onto one or two um, sectors to really drive hard, to get inside them, to understand exactly what I said earlier, the minutiae and the detail, to find what is that small competitive advantage that we can create through regulation, through legislation, or whatever, that will actually spark um, uh, uh, new industries and new growth on the island. I, th I think it's funny to hear Guy say about try and please everyone and link that with government. I think that's, uh, that in itself is indicative of the type of place we live in. Considering we've got a horse tram walks down our main road, we're actually very forward thinking and very collaborative. I think a, a session like this and, and forums like EGSAB, I don't know if everyone in the room knows EGSAB, Abby, but these sort of forums where, which are very inclusive, very collaborative, I open a Slido, hear from you, we're going to record this on video, some of it might be promotional, so maybe I'm the positive speaker and guys the reality check, but um, th these sort of things are not normal. Uh, you can move to London and the UK if you like and not have that, uh, you can move to Malta and not hear much or not particularly trust what's happening uh, behind closed doors. But um, I, I, I'd put a positive spin on that as well. I've always felt that the doors open and even coming and starting a startup to be able to walk into Steve Brennan, CEO of the entire regulator's office, sit down and have an adult conversation, that's not normal either. So I, I, I think that, again, we've got all of the pieces there for, for a start, the, the starting points. Um, to be attractive, and as Guy said, then go and build on it. The fact that the government's open, though, is, I think, a good start. So what you guys can take away from your action today and add to the already strategic action plan will, will, will make moves. We, we know uh, cannabis, esports, blockchain, all of these things keep coming. It's quite forward thinking. Um, just need to get rid of that tram. <laughs> So we did touch on it before, you know, we, we've had a strange few years and, um, you know, the, the way things have been over the last couple of years in that kind of post-pandemic world. Um, is there anything else that um, you feel that has touched your businesses that, um, you know, has evolved your ways of working just beyond even just the, the remote working piece? Yeah, I mentioned free movement. I think that, that there's two sides, I think, of skills, talent movement, and free movement for people in general in, in, in current climate. 
On the skills talent side, I think if we get what we do with permits right, if we get transfer and continued tenure essentially, so everyone that's come over to the Isle of Man made it their home and they're working towards indefinite leave to remain because they'd love to have family here and stay here. When they then go on to work for Kim at Games Global, that needs to be seamless, that needs to be smooth. So that's that free movement between companies so we don't lose talent completely from the island because I came from an office where a lot of people are pretty disappointed at how things are run today and probably miss people like Guy being in the building at Poker Stars, and we need to make sure as a room we have a place for them to go and make sure that's easy. The other part of free movement I would say is far more political and far more high level, but what the government did to support the Ukraine through the current issues, if you then think more recently, uh, Russians have been on the run, and what have we done for Russia? And it's a first-hand, uh, example for me because we've got 15 developers that were previously in St. Petersburg. Two of them are running away from conscription and the rest of them would just rather not be in Russia. Can we be that place that's a bit of a safe haven that doesn't have the full effect of Brexit, that um, has the ability to bring people in and give opportunity and find a way, like how could we be a tech hub? We talk about fintech, we talk about tech in general, but we're not a tech hub. If you look at a location like Porto in Portugal as a tech hub or Cluj in Romania, um, even we had Toronto and Dublin as huge tech hubs. Isle of Man's not a tech hub. We've got tech talent, but how do we take that to the next level and say, well, we should be a tech hub. We know to get talent here, we often have to pay London wages, we need to support relocation, and we need to make it smooth for people to come here in the first place. But if we're doing that anyway, then like double down on that as an effort, and like I'd love to have 12 of those uh, 15 Russians here and, and create something with them and already it's something we're talking about with the government to be fair so it's a it's a live issue a real issue but just considering those macro issues and thinking how can we at a micro level make an opportunity of that as a small population with jobs to give and lots of great management as well to, to direct um, yeah that, that'd be things I call out as far as movement anything else for me Ricky? I think probably just to add on to that we need some decent properties for them to live in and some rental prices. That's one of the things that we need to really look at as an island. We have a mass um, a mass number of people trying to relocate and you know the local location agencies are great, but actually it's the, it's the properties that we um, have on island and you arrive probably into Ronald's Way or if you're really unlucky on the boat into Douglas Harbour, um, which is not the you know, necessarily the shining lights that you want to see when you're relocating. And I think there's a bit of work to do on that, that front as well. Yeah, and I think we've got, um, you know, the Manx Development Corporation that is looking at those brownfield sites as well and trying to understand how they can develop that in a way that's in fitting with, you know, with the businesses that we work with and the people that live here as well. Um, I guess as well, um, for the point around um, you know the brownfield sites it's about understanding what businesses need I mean um, he's touched before about you're not going to have 200 people in an office so actually you know some of those brownfield office sites could they be something else and I think that's part of the wider conversation between kind of Manx Development Corporation DFE planning and making sure that is a joined up conversation and that they understand what is the market's needs for that that's an interesting one. So I think that was one of the biggest gaps when I started leading this startup locally is normally as a startup you try and do on the business commercial side lots of revenue shares and sharing revenue to make it to sort of take pressure off you in terms of cash flow but also as an operation and setting up a physical presence you quite often will get into co-working or have you know almost a temporary type arrangement before you're forced to go then go and build a fit out and find a location and settle in said location. I think the government does a good job of supporting startups with that initial fit out and that first offers, but it's actually not what startups are probably looking for. Mm -hmm. If you go and type in Regis in any city around the world, you'll probably get three or four facilities from that company, Regis, as far as having co-working availability. It doesn't, you won't hit anything if you search three to Silo Man. And, and the hub as a location or uh, Barclays Eagle Labs and the, the, that type of environment, it's again thinking about that a little bit more wider scale. If we truly do get one of these new industries to stick, we're going to need those facilities to be available and also respect that startups, they don't have money to burn for big full office fit outs either. So what's our co-working like to let them 
on board slowly into the location, still get them in, in the, through the door, um, but give them a chance to stay here with a sort of longer, gradual process to settling down. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably, I would, I would on, on the property front, I would absolutely support that. It's, uh, property is one of those bizarre things which can be uh, uh, the bane of a startup's life, working with a, with a, uh, a couple of uh, small startup businesses. Uh, and growth businesses, um, it can be remarkably painful. I mean, I'm very pleased to note, um, however, that that um, uh, as many as many of you who are islanders here will know, the uh, the planning process is a painful one. But I believe there is actually quite considerable work underway to make it easier, because we do live in a, this very strange world where it's as hard to put a sign outside of your building um, to say who you are as it is to build a new wing. Uh, it's the same process. Um, um, but I'm very pleased to see that's changing. But that's an example of where, in terms of encouraging uh, growth and in trying to get businesses onto the island, it's, it's, it's a whole multifaceted set of uh, uh, sectors and issues that you've got, you have to look at. Okay, so I think moving on to that kind of future landscape for global businesses, you know, we know that that landscape is changing. Um, so where do we see areas that will impact businesses where the Isle of Man can add value? We haven't discussed. As yet. Um, well, <laughs> um, well, I suppose uh, uh, as a bit of a throwaway comment, actually, it's the talent pool potentially. Uh, again, it's, it's really nice to see the uh, the skills and um, um, the skills and talent strategy coming forward. Uh, but I do think there's a, there's a, there's there is potential again. If going back to that visa process, if the Isle of Man can own the process, if the Isle of Man can actually get out. Uh, it can turn it around, turn it into an opportunity to, to give people from the European Union much better access um, uh, to uh, English or, 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 or um, English speaking businesses um, uh, on the Isle of Man. I mean, it becomes a competitive advantage. But that aside, actually, coming back to the sort of world of digital, um, I'll do a shout out for the session immediately after lunch because I think that's of particular, particular interest to me because one of the, one of the issues is a, as, a, as a large global business operating across many, many jurisdictions that is consumer facing um, is how you deal with sensitive data. Having to move them between different regimes without having to have servers um, all hosted in every single jurisdiction you do business with, um, in, etc, etc. There is something around, and this has just got worse and worse and worse, and, uh, and, and Heath will remember this well, when we were back in the days of implementing GDPR. Uh, that uh, Brexit came hot on the heels of and were we or weren't we GDPR compliant in the Isle of Man, we had a, it was a nightmare, uh, it was a complete nightmare. Um, and that is just going to get worse. And I think there is something, I, I'm not, I don't know what it is, but there's something in my bones that says the Isle of Man can play a role um, in that world of uh, managing um, uh, uh, sensitive data that is able to comply and is able to be cross-bordered around the world. So I, for one, will be attending the first session after, uh, after, after, after lunch from KPMG. Yeah. I, I kind of reflect on that and wonder if we did enough post-Brexit as a place that had slightly different um, limitations and, and far less as far as that process. Um, I wonder more recently in setting up a startup in gaming, if we're doing enough in some of the sectors, the mature sectors we already have here in the Isle of Man, and I know uh, banking, including the Isle of Man, is largely global, but just as some of the big global banks moved to an island's jurisdiction to instead be sort of headed up by the UK on every decision that was made and every contract that was signed, and instead pooling with the likes of Jersey and Guernsey, and I'm sure there's some people from said industry in this room, could we be doing more to support some of these newer, and, and in our case, not new, uh, areas of business because it's very difficult actually in gaming to get bank accounts and and you do wonder with the amount of history we have with the regulation we trust with the leadership and standard of companies we have on the Isle of Man could that be a, something that we address and um, we're bringing in I know um, the GSC had a backlog of loads of companies from uh, all throughout Asia and the world uh, looking to regulate their online gaming here it um, would be great to see uh, those staff on island and be great to see those staff on island paid through Isle of Man banks quickly, easily, because that company is able to get a bank account in the island. So I, I think there's things like we can even think about our mature industries here and how can we 
support this sort of growth of the of the existing industries that probably differentiate us from most places and I'd say e-gaming is one area of differentiation for sure and it's one area as I mentioned at the start of this conversation that we should consider a good place to retain talent on the island as things struggle in other industries or as things don't make it because we'll try lots in this startup space and in this emerging space and a lot of it won't work. Hopefully some of it sticks, but for that that doesn't work, we've got a 20 year old industry here that continues to grow. There's a backlog of uh, application on the GSC's desk for new licensees, we're one of them. And we just have to capture that as an opportunity uh, across industry and look at programs like going back to the old school internship type programs, cross skilling, how can we put ourselves in a position if the local financial institutions under pressure but they've got accounting skills that we know is needed by Kim's team at Games Global with all these finance roles and make that a process that's uh, attainable. So uh, yeah, we talk quite a lot about skill but I think the skills being spoken about in terms of loads of open position can't get the talent. I'm talking about it from a different angle which is in future and as we grow as, a, as an island and industry, how can we utilize what we already have here? Um, so yeah. I think um, one aspect we can look at, and this is probably aside from business, but more as an island, is the ESG piece. So I think there is a panel this afternoon on it, but as we see the next generation coming through into businesses, environmental, social, and governance is the, the, the next generation that are more focused on that than anyone in this room will have been to this, this point in time. Um, and I think there is something there that actually as an island, we could harness, I don't know quite what, but you know, there's a number of streams that actually a lot of people in this room will be looking at from their business point of view. And actually, if that could become a selling point that the Isle of Man focus upon, and you know, um, that will also help go back to the people, bring the people to the island, give them something that they want to focus on. Um, and there could be a strength we could pull on there. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to finish a little bit early and give you the inside track into the lunchroom, uh, which I'm sure everyone will be very happy about. Um, I'd like to thank my panellists very much for um, speaking with us today. Lots of great discussion points and I think quite a lot for us to uh, take away and understand where we can uh, assist with the opportunity on that side. So we are going to now move to lunch, which is sponsored by Domicilium. There will be a prize draw which you can enter using the QR code on the flyers which will be in the lunchroom. Um, please can I ask all speakers and panellists to hold back and head to the stage for a group photograph and also the Digital Isle of Man team following that. And after lunch we'll be back with uh, sessions in the main room and the breakout sessions. Thank you very much.